Is 2022 the year of the buyer? Is it gonna crash? Can you finally get your opportunity to get a deal? We're gonna talk about all that and more today on the Living in Coastal Virginia channel. My name is Dan Inman, your local realtor and guide. Let's roll. So you're curious about what is 2022 going to look like? Are you gonna have an opportunity to buy a house? Is there gonna be a crash? Should I wait? Uh, so one of the things that I think every single person needs to understand is that the basics of the housing market do not change. Supply versus demand. How many buyers there are versus how many sellers there are. If you increase the amount of buyers that are out there, prices go up. If you decrease the supply that is out there, prices go up. The opposite is also true. If you increase the supply, prices tend to go down. If you decrease the amount of buyers out there for the demand, prices tend to go down. So how does this play into effect for 2022? Let's talk about that. There are about a dozen different voices out there to pay attention to big voices that tell you what projections are gonna look like 2022, 23, 24, and beyond. The main four that I tend to pay attention to are NAR, National Association of Realtors, Mortgage Banking Association, Fannie Mae, and Freddie Mac. The number one thing to pay attention to that affects the amount of buyers that are in the marketplace is going to be interest rates. Obviously, the lower the interest rate, the more buyers that can enter into the market, right? So if you keep lowering their interest rate, the people that are at the very, very bottom, the first time home buyers, it brings more people into the market. If you raise that interest rate, it will decrease the amount of buyers that are out there or the purchasing power that someone can't afford when they're going out and looking for a home. Now, the average that is projected for you know the next year, so I'm looking down at 2022 for Fannie Mae, that's 3.3, Freddie Mac, 3.5, Mortgage Banking Association is 4%, and NAR at 3.5%. So if you were to strike kind of an average there, we're probably looking at somewhere between 3.5%. This last year, it was right around 3.1. Um, the Fed has basically come out and said that they're no longer going to push as hard for the interest rates to remain low. But um, I've gone and I've watched a couple of different videos, of, you know, investors, other real estate agents. Some people are kind of playing that whole, the high, sky is falling, the sky is falling. Chicken Little, what is it? What's going on? The sky is falling. The sky is falling. The sky is falling. Are you crazy? You know, as soon as interest rates go up that, you know, the market's going to crash. It just doesn't work quite that fast. The main reason for the crash of 2007 and 2008 is that a ton of people were getting loans they shouldn't have been getting them in the first place. So when we're talking about rising interest rates or rates going up, we're probably going to see a slow increase. So I'm looking down and I'm seeing that, you know, the rates of the projected rate of increase for 2022, 23 and 24 is a increase, but it is a slow, gradual increase. Something going from 3% up to 4% or even 4 or 5% is not going to crash the market. It just doesn't happen that quickly. You need big, extenuating circumstances to make big shifts in the market, i.e. the amount of foreclosures that happened in 2007 and 2008, of which if you watch the big short, of which I highly recommend, maybe a picture over here to my over my shoulder of what you should watch, you had a whole bunch of people that shouldn't have been getting loans um, they were doing things called like ninja loans, no job verification, no income verification. They basically said, hey, you have a pulse, here's a loan. And then you had people who were going out and buying homes that shouldn't have been there in the first place. Now you have to understand some basic human psychology here. Um, Sean, are you familiar with like what the, the percentage of people who win the lotto, who become broke? Yeah. A couple years, something like 85 or 90%. Your money habits don't change drastically over time. They don't tend to happen very, very quickly. Money habits, like any other habit, is developed over a period of time. So if you take someone with poor money habits and hand them a whole bunch of money, well, the statistics do show that they probably aren't gonna treat that the way if they had earned it or saved it over time. This is kind of what happened in 2007 and 2008. You had a whole bunch of people that were given a bunch of money that probably would have access to it prior. So let's go back to the interest rate thing and what we're talking about there. Interest rates are going to rise. There's really no way around it. I don't think that they're going to rise very quickly. And the amount of people that are going to be excluded from the market from that rise is going to be a slow, 
steady progression over time. The next big thing is gonna just be supply, right? So there are a lot of people that are holding off, moving into the market. A lot of move up buyers, right? If I hear the inventory is extremely low and I need to sell my house and buy the next one, I don't really wanna put my house in the market if I'm not gonna find the house that I want that's out there. This is kind of like a self-feeding kind of cycle. You have people that are not putting their house on because they're afraid they're not gonna find what they want and that kind of feeds into itself. So what's really fascinating here is that I've seen a lot of people decide not to buy a house because they thought the housing market was crazy and stupid. Now, I will admit that going in one full year in appreciation, I think the average here, let's take a look real quick. We saw about 17.7% .7 increase over the last 12 months. That is a huge increase. The Case-Shiller uh, Inflation Adjusted Index, I think is 3.4 for almost the last 150 years. So you can see why there's a lot of like, concern that the marketplace was seeing that much appreciation in that short period of time. 2020 actually saw almost 11% appreciation. So you had two massive years. I literally had someone that bought a house a year and a half ago and sold literally just yesterday uh, for about a $60,000, almost a $60,000 profit after you know paying all the fees that are included. That is unheard of. It's very unnormal. So what we're gonna see here is that Incomes have kind of done this. Housing prices have done this, right? There's a disparity between the two. There's, there's a gap between the two. And what's likely going to happen is that the amount of people at the bottom that can afford homes is going to decrease over time. And it's basically, you're going to see a cooling off of the market. Now the cooling off the market does not mean the housing crash. What this means is that the appreciation that we've seen, the 11%, the 17%, is gonna come back down. Now the projection, so according to this article here, Fannie Mae has it at six and a half, Ready Mac has it at 6.8, NAR has it at 6.8, and Mortgage Banking Associated 7.3. So somewhere right around that six to 7%. This is still somewhere around 1.75 to double what the average has been for the last 150 years. So still a, like if you didn't have the last two years of context and you heard 7% appreciation, you'd be like, amazing. I'm getting two years worth of appreciation in one year. That's a super awesome. So I just don't want people going out and thinking that this market is going to crash. The cooling off literally means that we're starting to head towards normal appreciation. One of the other things affecting this, again, so supply would be new construction. Now, new construction throughout history has made up anywhere between you know 25% to maybe even an eighth of the amount of home sales per year, depending on how many homes have sold and how many new construction starts have actually happened. In the past 25 years, we have just now in the last year caught up to the average of the last 25 years of new construction starts. Back in 2009, 2010, 2011, we were way, way, way below, right? And so this contributed the, to the housing inventory, not enough homes for people to buy that it's out there. In the middle of COVID, there was a huge concern because basically COVID hit and the new construction starts tanked, they bottomed, which makes sense, right? There was a whole pandemic thing going on and basically they cut everything. They were like, we're not doing anything until there's some certainty into the market. Well, the housing market went nuts and it immediately jacked back up. So the, that or the projection of those over the next two or three years is to go up. So like I said, I think interest rates going up is going to decrease the buyer pool slightly. The amount of new construction and homes that are out there is going to supply is going to slowly increase. We typically do see an increase in January, February, and March, just like every cycle every, every single year. But I do not see the housing market crash i think i'm i'm in alignment right here with what these major institutions are projecting seeing somewhere between six and seven percent appreciation for this next year again a great amount of appreciation and something to look forward to what's something that could affect this that could be that extenuating circumstance we're talking about well it wouldn't surprise me if a political party whether this is right or left takes up the mantle of home affordability right what if you look back in the past of the history of how politics is played they usually go for political expediency over maybe long-term sustainability or even long-term health. So what would that potentially look like? It wouldn't really surprise me if there was a push, I don't know if it's approved or not, of a 40 or a 50 year loan product. Effectively, you know, you just have to go out and buy a car here recently to understand how this works. A car loan in two years is a much different payment than a car loan over 72 or 84 months, which is, they're out there those are they have those loan products available so they could push and say hey for the average person to be able to afford a home we need a 40 or a 50 year loan product 
Again, I don't know if it's actually gonna happen, but it wouldn't surprise me if someone pushes for that. There was already talks, and I believe um, a couple of you know people that were already in forbearance, the 40-year loan product was offered to be able to keep them into their home. The other one would just be first-time home buyer tax credits. Now, Biden's tax credit program, I don't believe is out yet. Uh, I think you have to stay with, in your home. It's gonna be projected, you have to stay in your home for four years. It reduces your tax load by $15,000, which would be a, basically double what the highest was, I think, in the Obama period. Um, but that, again, is going to be a short-term solution. You're taking people who maybe couldn't afford a home and making it available now. Again, increases the amount of buyers and just kicks kind of the can down the road on running into that home affordability problem later. Another one of the major things that contributing to or what people were going to assume that was going to cause a crash would have been forbearance and foreclosures. What we've actually found is that the most of the people that were on forbearance didn't um, necessarily, not all of them needed it. People were just told, hey, you don't have to pay your mortgage, even though they could afford it, they just didn't. Most people have come back and off the, those four brands programs and have either taken advantage of the restructuring of the loan or caught up on all their loan payments. I'm looking at just FHA and VA active forbearance plans. It looks back in like April, May, June timeframe of 2020, there was about 4.8 million active forbearance plans. If we fast forward to today on just, again, just FHA and VA, we're right around a million. Um, and, and that trend that slow precipitous like drop off of active forbearance plans has gone across on Fannie Franny and Fetty on um, conventional loan products uh, but that total amount has gone down substantially over time. The other thing would just be foreclosures right so just the forbearance plans and foreclosures those are a little bit separate they're a little bit correlated obviously if you're in forbearance you could go into foreclosure uh, but you could also not be on forbearance and slip into foreclosure as well and foreclosure is just when the bank basically takes the house back because you're no longer making payments on the house that varies a little bit from state to state on how that works and how quickly they can do that um, but i'm reading here an article on the denver post and we're looking at there was somewhere around 180,000 mortgages and foreclosures this last year says rick sharga and it Executive Vice President of Realty Track. Before the pandemic, foreclosures were averaging closer to 500,000 a year. So we're actually lower than we were in pre pandemic numbers. That is a pretty healthy number overall. Um, and, and when I say healthy, obviously that's terrible for those individuals. But when we're looking at the grand scale, we're looking at numbers and averages and percentage rates, um, it looks overall pretty healthy. So all of those foreclosures people were expecting to flood the market and lower real estate prices, it just haven't, they haven't actually materialized. The people that were on those programs, um, you know, the average equity, I think just this last year, the average equity earned in 2021 was something right around $50,000 nationwide. That is a ton of equity. So even if you did have an issue, um, a lot of these banks are allowing you to restructure your loan and keep you in your home. Average tenure is also up. The average for probably the past 30 or 40 years was probably somewhere between five and seven years. The last uh, numbers that I looked at was somewhere between nine and 10 years, which means people are staying in their homes longer. The homes are appreciating more. They are paying that mortgage off more over that period of time. And so there's more average equity in the home than there was in 2007 and eight. So with the average tenure being up and there being more equity in the homes, the likelihood of foreclosure or short sales has gone precipitously down. So how do you take all of this into advice? What should you do? What is 2022? I have to make a decision, Dan. Am I gonna rent? Am I gonna buy? what should I do? So we're going to cover a couple things on first time home buyers, move up buyers, maybe even retirees. My advice in general has always remained the same. You need to make a decision that's smart for you on your financial kind of portfolio right now. Don't buy too much house. Like even though interest rates are down and low, don't put yourself in a house poor situation. You don't want that mortgage payment being so much that if if something, there's a book called Anti-Fragile by the, his name's Nassim Taleb. Um, and it talks about like how how easily wor your world or a system can be disrupted. So if if you were on the verge of being house poor and let's say one, you're, you're living on two incomes and one of you has to take a pay decrease, um, you know, you end up having a baby and you have to be out of work for a period of time. You don't want to be in a position where you have to sell because selling is the most expensive part of owning. And Sean's heard me say this millions of times, the longer you own real estate, the better, right? You're paying that mortgage off over time. You're capturing the appreciation over time. And that, what I like to call, I guess, the, the duck bill effect, the gap between what you owe on the property and what it appreciates gets 
increasingly exponentially better over time. And then eventually you're, you don't even have a mortgage payment anymore. So where people, most people get into trouble is when they own real estate for a short period of time. One of my main concerns is that the, the people, the clients that I've had recently who have bought a house and sold in one or two years and made money is that they're gonna enter into their next home ownership period with a false presupposition that you can own for a short period of time consistently and win. They're gonna shoot themselves in the foot if this is the case. Speaking about home payments there, something that's kind of interesting about the Virginia beach market versus other markets. So Denver and certain places in Texas are different, um, meaning every market's a little bit different. Denver and, and certain places in Texas, their payments are actually 50% higher almost than uh, the 2007 and 2008 crash. Meaning the peak of those markets, their market is even 50% higher than what that is. Virginia Beach is actually 20% lower than that previous crash, which is really good for us. It means that one, um, that we're nowhere close to what that pre-crash numbers look like, um, and that there's still plenty of room for home appreciation without us really getting into too much trouble. All right, so back to my uh, advice for um, people who are looking to move up. Now, if your main concern is, hey, I'm not sure if I'm gonna find the thing that I'm looking for, even if I sell my house, you wanna give yourself as much time as possible. So if you have the ability to mark in the notes, hey, um, I need a 60 or 90 day window. Now, just a quick note here, anyone that is buying your home with a loan, whether that's conventional FHA or VA, is likely that person is going to be held to a 60 day window. Most likely, the bank is gonna say, hey, if you're planning on owner occupying this, you need to actually occupy that building within 60 days of close. So um, it, I would say it is probably gonna be beneficial for you to close on that property so that you can go out and make non-contingent offers, but you wanna give yourself as much time as possible. If someone comes in and buys your house cash, which I've had clients who have that situation, there is really no cap there. It's whatever they, the new buyer will allow or what allow, is allowable in their life. But you wanna give yourself as much gap as time period so that you can find the next house that you're really looking for and that you really like. I hope all of that makes sense. And if you were looking for, hey, the market is crashing, the, wall, the sky is you know falling, this video is not for you. Uh, I try to keep a even level head on all of this stuff and you wanna make sure they give you good advice to make actionable things and, uh, and make good decisions for you and your family. Until next time, see you later.